Okay, ELA1. This is the Odyssey, book 22. It occurs to me, I think I stopped a couple paragraphs shy of book 21 last time, so let's kind of go back just for one second. Remember, basically Penelope has been using cunning this whole time. She was making a funeral, a burial shroud for, I believe it was her mother, or Odysseus's mother, I think. Um, it was either that or Odysseus' father, or Laertes, was, is dying. Regardless, the suitors were pressing her all this time. Pick one of us, pick one of us, pick one of us. So she used her metis, her cunning, to keep them off and said, let a good Greek wife do what a good Greek wife does. I have to make this burial shroud. Once it's done, I will pick. But every night, she crept down and undid her work. So they would weave on these giant looms and make this, you know, quilts and blankets and stuff. So she was making a burial shroud. And they saw her working all day long. All day long, she's looming and weaving and working. But then each night, she comes down and undoes her work. So she's perpetually mourning. She's perpetually working on this thing and thus perpetually not picking a suitor. They bust her. They say, all right, woman, enough's enough. So she says, all right, let's hold this contest. Whoever can string Odysseus's bow, which is hard enough to do in and of itself, and then shoot a straight shot. So they lined up 12 axe heads so that the where the axe goes, you know, there's this hole in the handle, and they lined it up, or the axe itself, I suppose, has this curve to it. So they basically made a tunnel of axes. So not only do you have to be strong enough to string the bow, you have to be accurate and shoot it all the way through this tunnel. And, of course, they were not doing like good Greeks should do. The suitors were taking advantage. You know, a good Greek should welcome strangers. They were taking advantage of Penelope's kindness. And when the old man, Odysseus, who Athena disguised him as an old man, came, they were really mean to him and rude to him. They were also, you know, they saw how we saw how they treated Argos, Odysseus's dog. So instead of being nice to animals, instead of treating strangers with hospitality, because you never know if it's a god in disguise, or in this case, Odysseus, they were really mean to him. Uh, we've got Telemachus, who knows it's his dad. He has gone down and removed all the weapons. And at one point, which I think our book skips over, Antinous, the head suitor, says, Hey, boy, what are you doing? Why are you taking down all the weapons? And he himself is very clever. He says, oh, well, I know eventually it will be you that will take over, and I want to polish them for you and have them nice. So he kind of plays on his pride, saying, oh, you're going to be the king soon. And don't you want the suits of armor and the swords and the shields shining and nice? I mean, you guys have been partying so much in the Great Hall, and all the smoke has put soot on them, and I'll make it nice for you. Obviously... If you're going to have a surprise, a sneak attack, you don't want your enemy to have weapons available. So that's why they did it. So he shows cunning and also Penelope does by creating this contest. And again, when Odysseus strings the bow, they were all shocked. And it says, Odysseus in one motion strung the bow, then slid his right hand down the cord and plucked it. So the taut gut vibrating hummed and sang a swallow's note. Just the way it rolls off the tongue, drips like honey, doesn't it? In the hushed hall, there's some good alliteration for you. Hushed hall or sang swallows. Even some examples of consonants. That's the uh, consonant sound. In this case, taut gut. So the consonants, right? It's a consonant sound that is the same, and it happens to be at the end. You got some assonance, which is some similar vowel sounds as well. Ut, gut, hummed, um, uh, uh. Anyway, it's the structure, the syllables they're laying down. It just flows beautifully off the tongue. That is the epic poetry, right? Then slid his right hand down the cord and plucked it. So the taut gut vibrating hummed and sang a swallow's note in the hushed hall it smote the suitors and all their faces changed then zeus thundered overhead 
One loud crack for a sign. Remember the thunderbolt, the eagle, these are signs of Zeus. So they should take note like, uh-oh, danger's ahead. And again, I mentioned this last time, this is a trope, a reoccurring literary device. We see it in films all the time. When there's thunder on the horizon, as above, so too below. When there's thunder and, and chaos in the skies, there will be thunder and chaos on the ground. And Odysseus laughed with him that the son of crooked minded Kronos had flung that omen down. He picked one ready arrow from his table where it lay bare. The rest were waiting still in the quiver for the young men's turn to come. He knocked it, let it rest across the hand grip, and drew the string and grooved butt of the arrow aiming for from where he sat upon the stool. Now flashed arrow from twanging bow clean as a whistle through every socket ring and grazed not one to thud with heavy brazen head beyond. Then quietly Odysseus said... Telemachus, the stranger you welcomed in your hall has not disgraced you. I did not miss, neither did I take all day stringing the bow. My hand and I are sound, not so contemptible as the young men say. The hour has come to cook their lordship's mutton, supper by daylight. Other amusements later, with song and harping that adorn a feast. He dropped his eyes and nodded, and the prince Telemachus, true son of King Odysseus, Belted his sword on, clapped hand to his spear, and with a clink and glitter of keen bronze, stood by his chair in the forefront near his father. Dun, 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 dun. So now we move to Death in the Great Hall. Now shrugging off his rags, the wiliest fighter of the islands leapt and stood on the broad door sill, his own bow in his hand. He poured out at his feet a rain of arrows from the quiver and spoke to the crowd, so much for that, your clean cut game is over. Now watch me hit a target that no man has hit before. If I can make this shot, help me, Apollo. He drew to his fist the cruel head of an arrow for, for Antidus, the head suitor just as the young man leans to lift his beautiful drinking cup, embossed two-handled golden. The cup was in his fingers, the wine was even at his lips. And did he dream of death? How could he? In that revelry, amid his throng of friends, who would imagine a single foe, though a strong foe indeed, could dare to bring death's pain on him and darkness on his eyes? That's a great line, bringing darkness on your eyes or the... Time to cook the lordship's mutton, right? You're, the hour is here. Odysseus's arrow hit him under the chin and punched up the feathers through his throat. Backward and down he went, letting the wine cup fall from his shocked hand. Ooh. Sorry, jumped around a little bit there. Back, uh, backward and down he went, letting the wine cup fall from his shocked hand hand like pipes his nostrils jetted crimson runnels a river of mortal red and one last kick upset his table knocking the bread and meat to soak in dusty blood now as they craned to see their champion where he lay the suitors jostled in uproar down the hall everyone on his feet wildly they turned and scanned the walls in the long room for arms but not a shield not a good ashen spear was there for a man to take and throw all they could do was yell in outrage at odysseus notice the little quote over here the question why does odysseus kill antinous first well what do you think why does he kill him first head suitor right to quote from the wire i think it <laughs> i think it was omar said something to the effect if you're gonna kill the king you gotta kill him in the court for all to see if you're gonna make a move on an enemy you gotta take out the head enemy but you don't do it in secret you let everyone know you're sending a message and that's the second part why does he do it in such a sudden terrible way why does he well as old omar said in the wire if you're going to do it, you make it an act that all can see. It is a statement, right? Not only are you taking out the head sitter, you're doing it in a very sudden, violent way because you are making a declaration. Here we have uh, some paintings. If you, if you take time, look up some depictions of Odysseus, the battle with the suitors. There's some really good classical art. 
you know, if we had more time, uh, that is something that we looked at. There's some, some, the great art is one of the things that we kind of have skipped over. We don't have as much time, obviously, but there's some really wonderful depictions uh, from the Iliad and the Odyssey, the Aeneid. The Aeneid is just the basically the Roman version of the Iliad. And then the Odyssey, of course, is the coming home. That's what we're reading. So, uh, of course, if you think back to our hero cycle, we are, of course, at the resurrection. He has literally come back to the ordinary world. No longer is he in the special world. He has returned and is tested one last time. Think of the Empire Strikes Back when Luke goes back to fight Darth. Um, when Darth reveals who he is, but he goes back. He returns and Odysseus to returns to overcome this last thing. And that is indeed the battle with the suitors. Foul! To shoot a man! That was your last shot! Your own throat will be slit for this! Our finest lad is down! You killed the best of Ithaca! Buzzards will tear out your eyes! So these are the suitors yelling at Odysseus. Why? For they imagined, as they wished, that it was a wild shot, an unintended killing. Fools! Not to comprehend they were already in the grip of death. But glaring under his brows, Odysseus answered, You yellow dogs! But can't you just see Clint Eastwood in a good spaghetti western? You yellow dogs, you thought I'd never make it home from the land of Troy. You took my house to plunder, twisted my maids to serve your beds. You dared bid for my wife while I was still alive. Contempt was all you had for the gods who rule wide heaven. Contempt for what men say of you hereafter. Your last hour has come, you die in blood. Again, I use Clint Eastwood, right? A good reader has the movie going in their mind. Maybe to you it's Bruce Willis or Mark, is it Mark Wahlberg? Mark Wahlberg, who kind of plays these roles, right? Uh, Harrison Ford, perhaps. Uh, maybe Mark Wahlberg is a better example for you youngins today, but you should have that movie in your mind. You should be able to see some of this in your head as we go. You die in blood. As they all took this in sickly green fear i love it when they use the the colors right we've got the red for the blood now we've got green sickness as they are realizing what is happening sickly green fear pulled at their entrails and their eyes flicked looking for some hatch or hideaway from death eurymachus alone could speak eurymachus kind of like suitor too he's not on the chart don't confuse him with eurycleia who we're still going to see a little bit of her, but she's one of the three that is loyal to Odysseus. I only had you write two down. So don't confuse this with Eurycleia, who of course is the nurse. Don't confuse Eurymachus with Eurylochus, who was Odysseus's top man, or one of Odysseus's top men. We breezed through this, our book brushes over it, but he was the one when they were on... Uh, remember, they got the prediction from Tiresias, don't eat the cattle of the sun god, Lord Helios. So when Lord Helios is blazing his chariot across the sky, he leaves his cattle untended. That's where they washed up and they had no wind. So they were basically starving on this land. And although there's these beautiful herd of cattle around, Odysseus says, no, don't eat the cattle. And at one point he goes up to pray to the gods and leave offering. And, of course, starvation got the better of them, and it is Eurymachus. When Odysseus's back is turned, this is an example of a warning. Don't do what he did. Chain of command. Listen to your leader, because Eurymachus didn't. And, of course, they ate the cattle, and the cattle come back to life and basically kill the men. Also not to be confused with Euemus. He is the loyal swine herd, one of the very few. Okay, so lots of E names. We are talking here. You're, um, sorry, I tried to hit pause and I don't think it worked. Uh, if it did, you're going to hear me twice. Yuri Macus. He is sort of like suitor number two. Okay. Don't confuse Yuri Macus with some of the other ones. He is not on our character chart. Okay. We've got Euimus, who is the loyal swineherd. We've got Yuri Locus who is the man in Odysseus's group when they are at the, the cattle of the sun god, when they're at the cattle, uh, um, Lord Helios is the sun god. He's got this island of cattle. They do wash up there. This was the Tiresian prophecy. Don't eat the cattle. 
And indeed, when Odysseus goes to give an offering, he turns his back on his men. And of course, his men, at the behest of Eurylochus, says, hey, what are we going to do? we got to eat these cattle. So don't confuse all these E names, right? So once again, Eurylochus is Odysseus, one of his top lieutenants, who tells the men to eat the cattle. Don't confuse it with Eumimus, who was the swineherd, who was loyal. Heck, there's even another one, uh, Eurycleia. She was also loyal. She is the nurse. So don't get confused. But uh, the one we're talking about now is Eurymachus. He is sort of like the suitor behind Antinous. He says, if you are Odysseus of Ithaca, come back. And all that the in all that you say these men have done is true. Rash actions, many here, more in the countryside, but here he lies, the man who caused them all. Antinous, he was a ringleader. He whipped us on to do things. We've heard this before, right? I was just following orders. He cared less for a marriage than for the power Cronon. Cronion has denied him as king of Ithaca. For that he tried to trap your son and would have killed him. He is dead now and has his portion, meaning Antinous the head suitor. Spare your own people as for ourselves. We'll make restitution of wine and meat that we consumed and add each one a tithy of 20 oxen with gifts of bronze and gold to warm your heart. Meanwhile, we cannot blame you for your anger. Odysseus glowered under his black brows and, brows and said, Not for the whole treasure of your fathers, all you enjoy, lands, flocks, or any gold put up by others, would I hold my hand. There will be killing till the score is paid. You force yourselves upon this house, fight your way out, or run for it, if you think you'll escape death. I doubt one man of you skins by. They felt their knees fail and their hearts but heard Eurymachus for the last time rally them on. Friends, he said, this man is implacable. Now that he's got his hands on bow and quiver, he'll shoot from the big door stone here, there until he kills us to the last man. Fight, I say, let's remember the joy of it. Swords out, hold up your tables to deflect his arrows. After me, everyone, rush him where he stands. If we cannot budge him from the door, if we can pass into the town, we'll call out men to chase him. This fellow with his bow will shoot no more. He drew his own sword as he spoke, a broadsword of fine bronze, honed like a razor on either edge. Then, crying hoarse and loud, he hurled himself at Odysseus. But the kingly man let fly an arrow at that instant, and the quivering feathered butt sprang to the nipple of his breast as the barb struck in his liver. The bright sword clanged down. He lurched and fell aside, pitching across his table. His cup, his bread, and his meat were split and scattered far and wide, and his head slammed on the ground. Revulsion, anguish in his heart, with both feet kicking out. He downed his chair while the shrouding wave of mist closed on his eyes. Sorry there, got distracted with my, my children for a moment, so let me continue on there. Uh, basically, Odysseus lets one fly at man number two, Eurymachus. He drops his sword, uh, the crying horse and loud, he hurled himself at Odysseus, but the kingly man let fly an arrow at that instant, and the quivering feathered butt sprang to the nipple of his breast as the barb struck to his liver. The bright broadsword clanged down, he lurched and fell aside. Pitching across his table, his cup, his bread and meat were spilt and scattered far and wide, and his head slammed on the ground. Revulsion, anguish in his heart, with both feet kicking out, he drowned his chair, he downed his chair, while the sh shrouding wave of mist closed on his eyes. Am Inimus now came running at Odysseus. So this is another suitor. Uh, broadsword naked in his hand. He thought to make the great soldier give way at the door, but with a spear threw from behind, Telemachus hit him between the shoulders, and the lance head drove clear through his chest. He left his feet and fell forward, thudding forehead against the ground. Telemachus swerved around him, leaving the long dark spear planted in Amphimenus. If he paused to yank it out, someone might jump him from behind or cut him down with a sword. At that moment, he bent over. So he ran, ran from the tables to his father's side and halted, panting, saying, Father, let me bring you a shield and spear, a pair of spears, a helmet. I can arm myself on the run. I'll give outfits to Eurymus, one the swine herd, one of the loyal few, and the cow herd. Again, I didn't put the cowherd on there because, as you can see, they don't even mention them by name here. Better to have equipment. 
said Odysseus. Run then, while I hold them off with arrows as long as the arrows last. When all are gone, if I'm alone, they can dislodge me. Quick, upon his father's word, Telemachus ran to the room where the spears and armor lay. He caught up four light shields, four pairs of spears, four helms of war, high plumed with flowing manes, and ran back, loaded down to his father's side. So, cowherd, swineherd, Telemachus, Odysseus, four. He was the first to put a helmet on and slid his bare arm in the buckler strap. The servants armed themselves and all three took their stand beside the master of battle. While he had arrows, he aimed and shot, and every shot brought down one of his huddling enemies. But when all the barbs had flown from the bowman's fist, he leaned his bow in the bright entryway beside the door, and armed a four-ply shield hard on his shoulder and crested helm, horse-tailed nodding stormy upon his head, then took his tough and bronze-shod spears. The suitors make various unsuccessful attempts to expel Odysseus from his post at the door. Athena urges Odysseus on to battle, yet holds back her fullest aid, waiting for Odysseus and Telemachus to prove themselves. Six of the suitors attempt an attack on Odysseus, but Athena deflects their arrows. Odysseus and his men seize this opportunity to launch their own attack, and the suitors begin to fall. At last, Athena's present becomes known to all as the shape of her shield becomes visible. And here we have the end of Book 22.